All right, so this is so exciting for me because I get to go and spend some time with my lover, <laughs> with uh, Chel Spa, you know, my my wife of 18 years, and just talk about the good stuff. And so thanks for coming and being on the podcast, baby. Thanks for inviting me. This is going to be fun. Yeah, so going, going back to the very beginning, like when when we first met, kind of what was in your brain? 19 years ago as a, <laughs> a, I think you're 19 year old. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm laughing because I've, I've, we've talked about this so much. I was committed to getting married. I don't know why. So you were I on just the prowl. was on the prowl, but we met, we met at the beginning of my freshman year, the beginning of your, your short stint at EVU. Yep. Um, but yeah, for sure, for sure. It was, you know, Living on my own, so exciting. Um, volleyball, dating, school. Also, yes, yeah, school for the first time, I think, in my life. I was motivated to to learn and to figure out what I was going to get my major in. What were you thinking? Yeah, I mean, I, we think we talk about that all the time. I was actually teaching at BYU yesterday. And I'm walking around. I'm like, these kids are so young. <laughs> Like 18. So, so young. And I'm 18, like, man, 19. I felt so old when I was 21. I felt like I was yeah. running that town. And then you look back and you're like, no, we were really, like, we were really we young. We were little we babies. Didn't know up from down. I no, I, I remember I, um, I went on my mission to Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of this completely empowering experience where you feel like you're really growing and helping and serving and just kind of becoming. And then I came back and my mom was doing my laundry again. And it was like mm. this, like just this, I don't, nothing against my mom, but it was like a low. It was like, Oh my gosh, like this isn't what How I How did want. I go backward? I mean, yeah. Like I need to get out of here. And so like, I was really excited to kind of get out and go. And I remember Jed Jensen, um, had said, Hey, you know, come down to UVU. And I played. It was Jed. I didn't you know, realize it was Jed. It was Jed. You know, Jed played there all four years, you know, had a real great career down there. And um, I remember I, you know, I'd played baseball a year before my mission in Montana. And I didn't know I was like coming down to try out. I thought I was like on the team. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> that doesn't surprise me. Like I, actually, like I really did. That's why I married you. <laughs> no, I, I really did. I did. Like you know, I just kind of rolled up and thought it was half. And I played so <laughs> bad in the fall, like I just didn't have it, and I ended up getting cut. But but you, I mean, even even before the cuts, you thought you made it. And, you know, at a certain point, you're like, like, oh wow, I am trying out. But you thought you were. I thought for sure I was on the it. team. Yeah, yeah. And I remember I got cut, and it was like it was really hard for me. It was like one of like the, I just hadn't had too many things in life that I hadn't succeeded at. Mm -hmm. You know, most of the time, like I could just kind of will my way into, you know, I could keep working or keep scrapping or grinding until I got it done. And this one was one that it just didn't work out. And I remember going up the canyon and literally just crying like a baby, like just kind of broken. I um, think I, had I just met you or did I not? I don't know, know if we met. Yet met yet or it was just kind of maybe just barely met mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I still like I had like this dream that I was gonna go play and so I had a couple of other options that I could go play and I could transfer in the spring that's and, right because I remember this conversation vaguely yeah there's that's kind of you school, throwing it around a little a bit there's a guy named Blair Lucas that had been like a hitting coach for me and he had a junior college in Southern California that I was going to go down and play at. And then I could go back to Montana and play at the school that I played at before. And so I was kind of going through this process of really thinking, hey, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go play. Like it was never not an option to go play. And I remember meeting you and we just started hanging out. And there was a point, I think it was kind of mid-December where I was like, I'm, I'm like really happy right now. Like I'm, mm. I'm like, I'm really happy. And it was kind of this crossroads where, you know, my dreams of being a professional baseball player <laughs> kind of disappeared. And, 
you know, it wasn't even like, hey, I'm going to go marry this girl. It was more just like, I'm, I'm actually having like a really No, it good... definitely wasn't at that point. No, it definitely, <laughs> <laughs> no, it definitely wasn't. I could have told you that. That's very true. So, <laughs> so we, we go, we go date, you know, um, and I remember there was kind of a point spring where I just realized, oh my gosh, I am in love with this girl. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like I, I am in love with this girl. And then life kind of, uh, set in where I'm like, how am I going to pay for this? Like, how am I going to pay for my school? I had a lot of confidence in you though. Uh, that, that still is like one of my favorite all time Chelsea stories <laughs> is the, the story is we found out we were in love and then almost simultaneously said we're getting married. And I think I made it to the ring shop wherever it was. Maybe a couple of days later with Brittany, my sister. Yeah. Picked out a six thousand dollar ring. I know, which <laughs> completely cracks me up. I had like a hundred and twenty dollars, like total, in my bank account. I vividly remember the jeweler coming out and saying, "You know, what's your budget? Have you guys talked about budget?" And I said, mm, "We haven't really talked about a budget, but you know, probably, I don't know, probably like five or six. <laughs> <laughs> so like funny. I had come from this, like." Affluent, so funny, wealthy background. I hadn't, I just, you know, you just knew naivety, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, like, uh, go, like, I, I was, I wasn't sharp enough back then to realize you could, like, get a loan for anything. And so the idea of, like, getting a loan for a ring just wasn't in the cards. Mm -hmm. Like, I didn't even know how to do that or, you know, what to do with it. And so I remember, I, you know, my friend had gone out and sold door to door sat he'd sold satellites in the summertime. And so I was like, well, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go mm -hmm. do what he did. If, if, if he can do it, I can do it. So I got excited about going out and selling. And I remember I had like 300 bucks, three or 400 bucks total to my name. Like this mm -hmm. was my total net worth and I need to get you a ring. And so I go into the ring shop, like <laughs> again, like, hey, you know, what can, what can I get? I need to keep enough money for gas to get out to Iowa. And so he brings out this ring, this this tiny little ring. It's like a speck. <laughs> and I was like. Whoa. A pave diamond. You don't know what that is, <laughs> I don't, but I don't know. it's a speck. It's truly a speck. <laughs> and it's like 150 bucks. And I was like, that that's all I got. So <laughs> I remember getting this ring and. We were going to go up the canyon. I had this, like, idea of, like, hey, we'll go up the canyon, you know. I do. I remember because I had a test the next day. I was very stressed out when we missed it our was, exit. It was super funny. I remember, like, we go to, where did we go eat? We Benihana's to, up Benny, in Salt Lake. Yeah, went to Benihana's, went and ate, and then we're cruising up the canyon, and you're kind of like, hey, I kind of need to get home, <laughs> and I've got, like, this romantic, you know, thing where I'm going to ask you, you know, to marry me. And I'm like, well, you can't go home yet. You know, Let, let's just go up the canyon. You're kind of like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we go up the canyon, you know, propose. And, you know, the the funny one that I look back at all this stuff is I get older. I look back and think about what I would do if some kid tried to pull this crap with my daughter. And it just would not fly. <laughs> but I had never spoken to your parents. Well, you had spoken to my dad briefly, briefly on the phone to ask if you. No, that's what I'm saying. It's the first time oh, I oh, ever oh, spoke I, to I was dad Okay, okay, yes. Was to ask him if I could marry you. The first that's time right. I that's ever right. communicated with him. Yes. <laughs> and um, and the phone died. And the phone died. And it was just Mid-conversation. Like, it's just like. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Somehow so, yeah. it worked, though. No, so we got, we got engaged and then. I drove out to Iowa and you went back to Houston mm -hmm. and yeah. I mean, and I that, was very proud of that ring. That, that, that was the start of the journey. No, it was, it was so fun. Yeah, it was really fun. There was one time when we were dating that I saw the crazy in Chels <laughs> and I was like, I don't know if I can, you know, she's not like. AKA just normal. Well, just, after know, 18 years. I like crazy this. is actually normal. <laughs> Not like that's just a preview. <laughs> crazy is normal. I'm talking to all the women out there and they're going, yep. No, I, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> it was like BYU graduation. We were going to get dinner. 
And like, I didn't do any reservations anywhere. So no one, like no one had reservations. No one. Literally from Provo down to Pleasant Grove. So we went to the pizza, pizza factory. factory. I remember this. No one's there. We go to Red Lobster. No, oh, Red Lobster. <laughs> you don't have it right. Red Lobster was the place we were supposed to that, go to. Was, and you were excited about I it. I was really excited. <laughs> I was very hungry. And Red Lobster was full. So, so finally, uh, <laughs> finally, we went and got Panda Express. <laughs> And and I remember you you kind of got like hangry. You were, <laughs> that's all it was. I was just hungry. That's all. And it was like the like. Let me finish it. <laughs> <laughs> because it's really not abnormal. People are gonna listen and go, "Yeah, I get it." She was hungry. I you know casually looked over because I could kind of sense an energy shifting from you and tried to make light of it and said, "What are you reconsidering marrying me or something?" And you looked at me like a ghost. <laughs> oh shoot! I don't know this girl. I was like, I, that's really what I was thinking. Is like, I you didn't never, have to say anything. I have never seen this side yeah. of this oh. girl, and and she's crazy. <laughs> oh man! And then I like pulled a one eighty, and then and then it, and well, then it got worse because well, that was worse because we had to switch cars to go up the canyon. We were going up to Heber with some close friends, and. Back then, the service was not good. Cell phone didn't work no. through the canyon. No, yeah, so you're talking 45 minutes, roughly, of serious reconsideration, contemplating reconsidering marrying me. <laughs> yeah. I, I remember we got out. I rounded it out. Here we are. We got out of the car and kissed you and. You kissed well. me and all was well. We, we <laughs> made it good. We got 18 married. years. And we've had a bunch of those over the years ever since. But Like I'm the only crazy one. I, I can go crazy <laughs> too. You're more crazy, but I can go crazy too. <laughs> so like, I mean, what were you thinking when we, when we got, we kind of started that journey? You, you only know so much. Your perspective is only so wide. And there was definitely a romantic idea of, getting married and starting a family and doing this together and spreading our wings and, you know, leaving the nest. Yeah. Um, but I really don't give myself enough credit. I knew with full conviction that we were meant to be married. How do you know? Uh, yeah, I, 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 we talked about it the other day with our kids. I think I have, um, a strong spiritual gift of faith. And I just knew I, I thought it would probably be more than faith. I mean, I, 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 I was very, um, aware of what I, what I wanted at that point. And we, beside, besides the crazy, besides that one moment, we really were falling in love with each other. And we had, dreams that were matching up and um ambitions that were exciting and i think we did really well at supporting each other from the very very beginning so there was a, just a lot of confidence going into our engagement and into our our actual like yeah I, I remember um i was on my mission and i dated this girl all through high school and i'm on my mission and i get the letter Mm -hmm. And it's like, hey, Case, you know, how, how are you doing? Um, I met a guy and we're getting married. And I still remember like right when I read it, I'm like, it just kind of hit me. And I'm like, oh, man, and I kind of, you know, knew it was coming. Um, but it was just kind of hard. And I remember going, you know, going into the into my bedroom and, you know, at that point, you know, prayer and scriptures and missionary was everything. And I remember just getting down on my knees and just praying. I just said, Hey, this is really hard. You know, made a lot of sacrifices to be out here. And, it, and I don't get like clear voices too often, but when I get them, they're like crystal clear. And I still remember getting like this, like clear impression. That's like, you have no idea 
mm. what I have like in store for you. I've got somebody that's so perfect for you. <laughs> and I look back 18 years later and I'm like, I, you know, it's that Garth Brooks song. It's, you know, sometimes you thank God for unanswered <laughs> prayers. And I think about like how beautiful the journey has been with you every step of the way. And I'm like, like God is good because, you know, there couldn't have been somebody more perfect for me. And so I take kind of that and I contrast that with us dating and, you know. He really does know the end from the beginning then because you were, that was 2000 what? Uh, probably 2004. Three? 2003, four. yeah. Because I was a junior and senior in high school and definitely <laughs> you weren't thinking wasn't about getting me. those impressions. No, nope, you, weren't, you weren't thinking <laughs> about me. Yeah, you weren't thinking about me. You were doing something else. Um. That's so, pretty amazing, though. No, really, really special. So, yeah. So what was going through your head then? I mean, you had that prior experience that had to have been popping in and out of your brain as we were. I, I had so many. I had so many like of these like bold kind of, you know, strong convictions at that point. And one of those was I'm going to go to school. I'm going to date a million people. Mm. I'm not going to settle down until I'm like 25, which felt like I was so old. You know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm going to go give it some time. I'm just not going to fall for somebody quick. I'm going to be established. I'm going to have a career. I'm going to have money. And then like six months later, I'm like smitten. <laughs> <laughs> the other one that was really funny was uh, I'd went to school the semester after we got back and things were going really good with work. Mm -hmm. And I had kind of those famous last words of like, hey, I'm just going to take one semester off, just one semester, mm -hmm. and really go hard at this thing. <laughs> that was the last semester <laughs> I ever went to school. Never, never went never back. Never went back, yeah. So it was all sorts of like kind of like bold, you know, decisions that were happening back then that were so shaping in my life. Bold, but you, you, um, I think you knew what you were doing to, to an extent. Because I, I never felt, I mean, I'm trying to think back to that time. And I mean, 18 years ago, it's a little bit, a little bit foggy, but I don't even remember thinking, shoot, what are we going to, what are we going to do if he doesn't go to school? Granted, you had had that successful summer. And so that was a really, um, great stepping stone for us. But yeah, I think if, if you have a gift and if there's been kind of a gift that you've given to me that I didn't even realize like how important it's been until I've got older is you have always just believed in me hmm. so much. Like, I don't know if you've ever wavered in like your hmm. belief of me and I've always just felt it and I've, I've felt the weight of it. You know, I never want to let you down. You know, they want to go make you proud and go execute for you. Yeah. And, but from the very day that we got married when I have like, 300 bucks in my checking account and you go, <laughs> you know, pick out the $6,000 ring. It's like, you believed in me more than I definitely believed I, in you. I believed in myself. I wanted that ring. <laughs> and, and, and there's like nothing that motivates me more than to like try to give you the world, you know, to try to go create, you know, the life that you want. And I think, yeah, I, because I would say, I would say ditto to that, that I've always felt like I have wings to go fly and, and do my thing. What, what do you think that comes from on your end? So, uh, one, it's just like what I believe. Like mm -hmm. I believe in believing in people and empowering people. Like I think the one of the greatest gifts that you can give to somebody is to believe in them mm -hmm. and empower them and, and just tell them they can do it. And I think all of us have had those people in our life that believed in us more than we believed in ourselves, And they mm -hmm. give us kind of permission to go try. And so, you know, and I had like a, the most amazing parents, you know, mm -hmm. I had these models of, you know, two people that were very different. You know, my dad and my mom are very different, mm -hmm. but they had shared values and they were completely committed to each other and they loved each other. And I just got like this view of, you know, what that looks like. They're mm -hmm. also very independent people. You know, they, each had their own hobbies and own, mm -hmm. you know, things that were their things. And, you know, I, and uh, another one that like really, really impacted me. I was talking to Vess Pearson about this the other day. Um, Gordon B. Hinckley was the 
prophet of the church or the president of the church when I was like young, when mm-hmm. I was mm-hmm. though that age. And I remember um, I just loved the guy so much. And he um, had his book and he was talking about kind of his relationship with his wife. And it was her talking about their relationship. And they were in their 90s. And she was always like an incredibly independent woman, mm-hmm. kind of a fireball. You know, she was kind of known as just like – kind of witty and funny and independent. And one of the things that she said was that he had always given her wings and that she always loved him for that. Mm -hmm. You know, probably in a generation where that wasn't normal. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, it was different back then. And they just always had that relationship. But I always thought about that as like, that is the type of person that I want to be is somebody that is the opposite of controlling that Mm -hmm. is abundant and is just, empowering, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I feel it. It's pretty amazing because it's translated well to our kids too. Um, I I I I don't know if they could vocalize it now, but later on, I think they'll, they'll say that, that, yeah, we modeled that for them. So talk about having kids, you Mm -hmm. know, how has that been? You always wanted to have kids. Always wanted to have kids. Yeah. I mean, it's different with like every year that passes. So we're now, you know, running the gamut with 15, 13 year old down to four and two with Covey in the middle. Um, so it's stretching me more than ever, ever, ever before in my mothering career. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I would say it's the hardest, but you know, I don't know, maybe memory starts to, um, memory start to fade and you forget. No, it's definitely hard. Right Maybe you have like, <laughs> like mom it, amnesia. No, no it's, it, hard. Okay, it's hard. It is like 3D <laughs> chess really hard. right now. I mean, we've got <laughs> we've got a 15 year old down to a two year old. Yeah, you know. And we 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 are like it feels anyway. We're 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 probably still so naive, um, and early early on in the game. But we've we're running the gamut on ages. We're running the gamut on personalities. It feels like way different. Way different. You know. Yeah. They just come out so different. Yeah. And so much different than I thought my life would be. Mm-hmm. Like which 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 makes it extremely difficult. But I I mean I don't I don't know that there could be anything else in my life that could provide as much growth as both of us are gaining from no. all the differences yeah. that are going on right now. Um what was the hardest time in our marriage? Hardest time in our marriage? Um, you know, it's interesting because we were talking about supporting each other. And um, there was a time when you, I mean, work has always been consuming. Um, and then there was the time where you started getting into hunting. You don't like that. <laughs> No, I did. That's what was so (laughs) conflicting about it, right? Because on the one hand, it's this joy that you feel for someone else if you love them um, because you see them happy um, doing things that they love. And then uh, I think just human nature gets in the way. Your natural man tendency to be whatever it is, jealous or competitive or... um, Comparing. I mean, I, I'm like a person of extremes. And so when I got into it, I like really got into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. I mean, if anyone ever wants to come over, our garage is evidence of that. It's beautiful, though. It actually has a great aesthetic. <laughs> <laughs> so hunting was the low point in our marriage. That's interesting. <laughs> no, I, I think I think it was just trying to figure out, oh, what is... What does supporting actually look like? For a while, it was it was easier because by the nature of the culture that we live in, you know, um, people that are entrenched in their work, it's really um, it's really noble, it's really purposeful, well, yeah, it's really needed. With, with work, I mean, it it's just almost been like that un- one for me, and it not, unconditional it not, yeah. from day one, and and which, right. which it, isn't for, actually normal. Like I've I've worked with. Yeah, that's true. Tens of thousands yes. of right. you know people 
And if there's any like one thing that I've seen like sabotage careers more mm-hmm. than anything else, it's the the spouse and the husband aren't on yeah. the same page. Right. And specifically, a lot of times, um, my experience is with the men that their their spouse has an unrealistic expectation mm-hmm. of what a life and a career should look like. Mm. Mm-hmm. And they a lot of times it was that it should be a nine to five. Mm-hmm. And that it's a normal job with benefits and, you know, you make enough money that yeah. it was just kind of well, this like fairy tale like right. view that like my experience just isn't real. Like it never Well, works and out like you that. say fairy tale. I actually think it might not be fairy tale. I think it's what did people grow up with? Because you're talking about us being young, newlyweds, and my paradigm is was not that. I had a dad who was an entrepreneur. He owned his own company and he worked like a dog, you know. He was up and out of the house before we were even up and out of the yeah. house. And um I mean when he was first getting it up off the ground, he wasn't back until, you know, 8 or 9 at night. Yep. Um, and then before before starting his own company, he was a stockbroker. And so those hours were crazy. I'm sure I don't remember that. But I remember um, the automotive shop that they opened up. And yeah, it was it was long hours. And my mom, she I mean, again, like both of us come from exceptional upbringings with parents that are phenomenal models of living just great principles and one of which is supporting yeah. each other. So I I will say that it was easy for me to support that, but it makes sense why it was easy. Just because you had really good models. This is of just kind what of, I this grew is kind of how, Yeah, this is just yeah, what I grew up with. This is how it works. Yeah. Which actually, funny enough, <laughs> my dad also is a man of extremes. And, you know, he would have his hobbies for however however long. Um, let's just pick cowboy mounted shooting and he would live and breathe it. And he became the world champion, cowboy mounted shooter, cowboy mounted shooter. Um, cause you grew up in Houston, grew up in Houston. Yeah. Um, there's so many barbershop quartet. There's so many. Um, and what's funny is, I mean, my, my, I think again, like I'm reiterating what my 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 mom was thinking. I think, like on the one hand, she was probably so happy that happy. he's happy. Yes, she yeah. could feel the joy that he found in these things. And then there was this weight of like, well, wait, I can only support so much. What about me? Yeah. <laughs> what What about me? Yeah. I shouldn't speak for my mom, but I'm but I'm thinking. Okay, this is where the hunting thing is coming coming. That's where um, the PTSD the is forefront. coming in. Yeah. yeah. That's, where, that's where you're feeling. It's it. really, it's actually, it has nothing to do with hunting. It has <laughs> everything to do with me and feeling less than. <laughs> I'm kidding. I never feel less than. Um, <laughs> so low point, what are, what are some other like low points? Like when you're thinking, um, you know, I, I could give you, I could give you a ton. I could give you a thousand was, high points. Like, okay. The, the, yeah. 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 I, I could, I could give a number of low points too. Um, when Callie was diagnosed with autism, that was a that was a low point. It was really hard. It was really hard. Yeah. Yeah, low because it was really hard. And um, you know, it was a, it was a, it was slow in coming, the diagnosis anyway. And so the the time of um you know, realizing something was awry in her development to the day of the diagnosis, you know, that's rough. Living in the unknown is really scary and it produces a lot of anxiety. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting with life because when you're going through something hard, there are, you know, inevitable life happenings that you just, you, you just do, you still have to wake up. You still have to make your bed. You still have to act normal in some regards, but then you're still holding this huge weight. Yeah. So I would say that was a low one, wouldn't you say? No, it was super. It was super heavy. I and it was interesting because we'd gone through like, you know, some hard times. We we'd worked at a company called Atlas Marketing. Mm. Um, had kind of grown our career there. 
felt like we were kind of on top of the world. It was 2007, uh, which is really funny today. I was golfing at Alpine Country Club, and I'm gar- golfing with this kid named Carson Lundell that's like an absolute incredible golfer. You know, he's number one on the BYU's team for a long time. He just turned pro. But I think we're on hole seven or eight, and I look over, and I see our house. Oh. I see, like, our original house, like, first house we ever built. And I was laughing. I was telling these guys the story. I was like, I was 20, 23. Did you tell them about our dog? Uh, no, I didn't tell them about our dog. <laughs> that was actually another funny story. Um, but I was 23, and we closed on that house. And the day that we closed on that house, they paid us $50,000 to close that. Like, that was 2006. I mean, that's what was going on. There was some crazy loan. Bought it at two and a half million bucks. But I it was still don't understand. Worth it, yeah. three million, and we get this check for right, right. fifty thousand dollars. And I'm like a 23 year old. I just gone out and knocked doors all summer, and I'm like knocking doors was really hard, and signing that paper and getting fifty thousand dollars was really easy. Like that's <laughs> like I'm doing the wrong job. I need to just go like buy houses and have them pay me. Like it was just like a like a crazy time. And just like kind of the rise, the fall was just as ugly. I mm, mean, the the mm-hmm. global financial crisis, it just, it absolutely like sh- sent shockwaves through the world. And well, I mean, yeah, that was another low point, right? We were right in the high, got into a house that we're, we were, we're in we're, over we're, our we're, heads. We were building and, kind of a million dollar house and kind of living our dream. 2006. Yeah, 2006 going into 2007. 2007. Yeah. I mean, we were young. I mean, I think I was... 20, 24. Yeah. 20. I was turning 22. Yeah. I was 22. You know, building this house and, you know, hoping that it happens again. You know, I'd been paid 50,000 yeah. from one house and Did sold not it. Did happen again. And everything went bad all at the same time. Mm-hmm. Like company that I worked for went out of business. The boss that I worked for, he stole like my last hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars. Literally came to me and said, Hey, do you still have that hundred thousand? I was like, yeah, but I don't think I'm going to invest it. And he said, well, you know, could you lend it to me? Wrote him a check, never saw it again. Yeah. Just stole it. So, like, I felt like such an idiot. I'm like, didn't even have, like, the heart to go home and, like, tell you that I had written a check for all of our money and my boss had stolen it. Hmm. And we're in a house that I thought would be worth a million five, and now it's underwater. And it was, like, this, like, low point where – I was like, how do I get out of this mess? Mm-hmm. And it was actually like, th- this is like an incredible life lesson. Um, is that so many times what you think is the worst thing that could happen to you is the best thing that ever mm-hmm. could have happened to you. Mm-hmm. And so many times what you kind of deem as maybe your worst day is actually your best day. Mm-hmm. And that experience changed our life. Um, you know, I was... I would have said, like, in my career path, I'm too good to be a door-to-door salesman. Like, I'm, that's beneath me. Uh, that work is beneath me. I'm going to go do, like, real professional work. And it took hitting rock bottom mm-hmm. and, like, literally desperation and then realizing, like, all my friends are losing their jobs. And I've got four different companies that are offering me jobs and offering me signing bonuses to go work for them. I'm like, the skill set that I have is is the only thing I have right now. I've lost mm-hmm. everything. And it, it reminded me of a quote. There's, uh, we, we did this conference called MW3. And we had, you know, just some really exceptional speakers come out. And Gail Miller came and, yep. and spoke. And she was talking about wealth. She was talking about money. And she said, you know, Larry, her husband, he had a definition of wealth. And he said, your true wealth is what you have if you lost everything. And I think about that definition in that moment. I, we had lost everything. Mm-hmm. And I was an extremely wealthy person. Well, I, it's interesting you say that because at the time I didn't, <clears throat> I don't even know that I would have understood what that meant if I had heard that quote then. But I think that that we, I, we knew it intuitively because we were going through this rock bottom experience, but neither of us was, you know, down and out, couldn't function, couldn't get out of bed. I we think getting after each other. We weren't like, no, 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 because our true wealth lied in 
so much more. The love that we had for each other, the support that we showed each other, our faith, our commitment to each other. When and I think back, and it, that was like this really, really beautiful time in my life. Mm-hmm. It was. Well, both of ours, because we we literally were pregnant with Callie when all of this was going down. Well, we didn't know. Like, well, that, that we're, happened we're, kind of along the way. So along like, the way, right. But right, that was kind of, true. that was part of what was so beautiful. I, I remember we ended up, I met Todd Peterson. That's right, because that was the fall. And then we were met Todd and Alex, January. which those guys are just two of my favorite mm-hmm. humans Family. on earth. Mm-hmm. Um, they're, they're, you know, special people in my life, you know, our life. But they, you know, we ended up, deciding to go work with Apex and, but I had like some problems. I didn't know how to sell security systems. It never managed a team. And so I made this plan and this is like my desperation plan. It's so funny. Like how just like these rudimentary simple plans. I was like, I'm going to drive to Arizona Mm -hmm. and I'm not coming home till I sell 10 accounts. And at that point, the way I had my pay, I'd make $700 a sell up front. That's how they were paying me to help me with cash flow. And I was like, if I can go sell 10 accounts, I make $7,000 and we can pay our bills. And, and it was kind of checking two boxes. It was like, we can pay our bills and I can go learn how to sell and I can train the people I'm working with. So Mm -hmm. I drive down there literally sleeping on like a, like a mattress with Jason Allen, Jason Allen (laughs) taught me how to sell. He was 18 years old. Yeah. Um, Brendan bowed, mm-hmm. you know, all these guys and go down sleeping on this mattress and going out and knocking doors in Phoenix, Arizona and like Phoenix, Arizona and the global financial crisis, like the world just ended. Like it, mm-hmm. it was like 13, like it, it was, a, hot it was a high percentage of homes were just foreclosed. Yeah. They were just not paying their bills. <clears throat> and we went, we figured it out, learned how to sell, got a skill set. But I still remember I was down there, I was with a kid named Jace Allen, who was so important to me that first summer um, as a kind of leader on my team. And Jace, uh, me and Jace and Zach Timmerman, we were all together. And I get this letter in the mail and pull it out. And it was kind of the the thing that said you're pregnant. Oh yeah. And I, 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 I remember I just, I just started bawling, called you like immediately <laughs> and, and like literally in my car driving home as fast as I could to go see you. And That's so right. I think about like these little moments of like mm-hmm. chaos was happening outside, but there was some way that, you know, we could just focus and, and go. Yeah. It's amazing. Cause we really were losing. We were losing. I mean, we were literally losing our house. We knew it. We had decided in December. We were actually in Houston and things were coming to a head. Atlas had already crumbled. We had already decided that we were going with Apex Apex yep. at the time. And we were down in Houston for Christmas and we were sleeping in my old bedroom, the one I grew up in. And we had just finished the house pre Thanksgiving. In fact, did we have Thanksgiving dinner there? I think we did. Yeah. I think we did with my family, barely furnished. Um, with like Pier One furniture, it had a restoration hardware table. Yeah, that's and crazy. The reason, Actually, a the restoration reason, hardware the couch. Reason. No, it was the couch. It was the couch and a table. Oh. and the reason I know that I was sure. because at Atlas, they told us, "Hey, go get a credit card, and you can use your credit card to buy all of our equipment, and you can get the points. Yeah. You can get the points, right?" And I don't know how, but they ended up paying off our credit card. Like we got super lucky. Yeah. But we had like $15,000 in points. We're like, oh, (laughs) sick. Let's go get a restoration. We just just built a 7,000 square foot home. (laughs) And I'm 21. Let's go go get a restoration (laughs) hardware couch at a a table, you know. And so, but I. That's right. Yeah. So going back to Houston. But we went back to Houston and, and I remember it was, we were just laying there and. You know, we, we must have been talking about um, everything that was going on. And it got quiet. And you said, hey, I, th- I, th- I think we need to sell the house. And I could, I could sense a hesitancy in your voice. And, um, I mean, it wasn't a shocker. We already had been talking about everything that was going on. And, 
And that was it. We just decided. We just well, knew I, I, and I we think, never looked I, back. I still remember that. I think the hesitancy is I was embarrassed. Mm. I kind of felt like I'd failed you or I'd let you down. And like, cause, cause yeah, while, while we've always really prided ourselves on this interdependent relationship, um, you know, interdependency comes from being like fully confident in your role and my role. And then we come together Yeah, and yeah, that, that was kind of your, Thing. your role, yeah, your like, jurisdiction. And I was very much still like head down, finishing my degree. Had I just mean, you were finished, playing volleyball full time. Well, yeah. and just, just finished my season. Um, and, and so, yeah. No, and, yeah, and different but, roles, but, but we just kind of like, it was over at that point. And emotionally it was kind of over after that. It was like, we're done with that house. Like it, we couldn't have got out of that house fast enough. I still remember I got sick um, the night we were leaving. And I was like, actually <gasps> like right. super sick. And we were all packed up. And That's literally, right. like, packed up to never come back. Like, we were... You all we, packed we, up. We were selling that house, and we were never coming back. And we were literally and going to sell for the summer. We were going to sell. In I, Texas. I remember calling the bank and said, hey, I lost my job. I lost everything that I have. I'm going to go be a door-to-door salesman. And they're like, oh, how, how, do we, <laughs> how do we, like, just don't do anything rash. Like, don't, like, damage the house. I'm like, I won't. Just. Don't, like, leave your house in the night with a U-Haul. <laughs> well, no, no, I was like, hey. Oops. It's actually like one of the great negotiations. I was like, hey, like I won't if you don't report it to my credit. And it was this like little bank in Omaha. They're like, okay. And they didn't, they never reported. Like we ended up, you know, missing some payments, like short selling the house and right. they didn't report it. Yeah. I, I will forever remember this lady in our, in our, in our ward, close to our neighborhood, our church ward. And she was old, like maybe in her 80s. And she came up to me one Sunday and, you know, we had a short sale sign attached to the bottom of our for sale sign, which is embarrassing. It's you know, embarrassing. Everybody, everybody knows what a short sale is, except for this lady. And she came up to me and she's like, hey, I saw you guys added that sign to the bottom of your for sale sign. It says short sale. Is that like a is that like a way to sell it faster? I'm like, yeah, it actually, it actually is. Yeah. It's like, Oh, all right. It's so embarrassing. <laughs> just like running out of the, running out of the neighborhood, like in the middle of the night, never coming Aww. back. We've gone back. We've driven past it. I uh, like driving, driving past it. And, and it was like so beautiful. We went out that summer to Austin, Texas. It was so fun. We crushed it. We like had this amazing summer, you know, it was life changing for, mm-hmm. For both of us, I, you know, I think back about that time we should have filed bankruptcy. We should have like many of our friends did many of our friends did like many people did. Like it Mm -hmm. was like a really bad outcome. And I think that's why I always have so much gratitude to Todd, to Alex, to Apex Mm -hmm. for building this company that was solid financially that was able to support us, that Mm -hmm. had the training. And I think I made, you know, $600,000 that summer when the world's imploding. Made the most money we'd ever made by a long ways. And we we never really felt the pain of the the, the crash. You know, that was the start. Well, you know, I don't know. I don't know that we allowed ourselves to. I don't know if that's the word because really, I mean – on the surface, some people might say like, oh, that's painful. You just went from a 7,000 square foot home, brand new, to leaving it to go live in an apartment for the summer to sell, and then to come back to live in an apartment. No, I, I remember I was like, we're going to rent. And we forever. were so excited. I'm like, we're going to rent forever. We're yeah. Like, um, I don't know. I, yeah, I don't know if it's called aloofness or what's going on because actually – that seems a little bit painful and embarrassing, but I don't know. I, we, I don't, we, we love that little I, apartment. We it was were down amazing. In the, River, the River River Bottoms. Bottoms or next to John Russell and Shelby Russell. Yeah, it was neighbors. amazing. We'd go to movies. We'd like walk over yeah. and go to movies. We had restaurants. Dinner, it was shopping. right by work. Right. Like, we would, like walk to work. Uh-huh. It, it, it was actually, on the Provo River Trail. Yeah, it actually like was really influential in us like being in Provo. You know, right. being in Orem, we were yeah, like, because we, we had really been like up in being close. Alpine we, Highland area. Yeah, we really like being close. Mm-hmm. Um, 
we stayed there. I remember we went to Dallas and sold the next summer in Dallas. Mm-hmm. And that and, was our first summer with a baby. And you, Callie had, you had Callie. Was already born. Yep. And Dallas was so fun. So mm-hmm. many memories in Dallas. Your sisters, you know. Right. We would always try to go to Texas because you had family down there. And so you could just kind of pop down and yeah, see them. Yeah, pop in and out, which was and, amazing. And that was actually like a, like from a grind standpoint, mm-hmm. we were going hard that summer. Like sales that summer yeah. were so hard. Like gas prices were high. It was 2009. It was like the peak of like the gloom of right. the world. And we're just out there, you know, knocking doors. And um, I remember we we were driving hours out to Tyler, Texas mm-hmm. and Jacksonville and Lufkin and Nacogdoches and these towns <laughs> quite a ways away just to like, yeah, I remember, you know, late nights, getting we, back. we 11, had a ton of success. I remember we were sitting, we were in the summer and I had my whole team. There was 50 people on our team. We had a really big team and we sent two car groups out to Tyler mm-hmm. and those two car groups did more than the other eight car groups. And I'm like, Okay, tomorrow we're sending three car groups. <laughs> and the next, you know, sent three car groups. And everybody in that, the next time we sent four car groups. And then for it about... It was gold t- for that long. It was like leprechauns. We were chasing <laughs> leprechauns. Like, and so from then on out, we're like, okay, we're driving. And so we literally, we'd drive out to Tyler, Texas. And we'd actually stay the night, you know, to like not have to drive. And so, and we'd all like put our money together. And yeah. we'd like stay in a yeah. little hotel and... That was a crazy time. It was actually a crazy area because it was next to one of the most, well, no, the most affluent areas in Dallas, Highland Park. And also we were on Mockingbird and near the tracks. And so we were, it was Oak Cliff. We were by, by the tracks that had brought people from Oak Cliff, which was really like impoverished and rough. And we had some crazy. Had so many crazy stories. I remember we were all in our correlation meeting and somebody broke into one of the apartments and locked the door. And the couple, I can't remember which couple it was, but they came and like they're opening the door and the person's in their house. I, I vaguely remember this. Who, who, who was, who was, who was? Like, no, I, I'm, I'm hesitating because I'm thinking of the other story where the girl got beat up in the, in the parking garage or she something. Uh, that was Tyler Godfrey. Um, yeah. his, his, his spouse. Um, but Jeez. I remember like they they open the door and they see this person robbing their apartment and the person like looks at him and jumps out like a second story window. That's right. And like runs yeah. off. And so like we had like people breaking nutty, into nutty, apartments. Nutty. We had like a robbery, like they like stole Brooke, Brooke Allen's purse. And yeah, after she was coming home from work. Yeah. She was working. Yeah, like stole her purse and these guys right. went and chased them and yes. like ended up like punching, you know, like it was just crazy. And then Chris Holmes, the last day of the summer, mm-hmm. he has like his, he has this Cadillac Escalade and it's completely That's right. full. Were they married? Married. The time? They, yeah. they, they have yeah, yeah, yeah. all of their like That's right. belongings in this Cadillac. Uh-huh. And somebody stole the Cadillac with all of their belongings, like the last day of the summer. Oh, (laughs) it's all coming back. And it was like magic. (laughs) (laughs) It was so great. We went home and, and that was it. So, I mean, that was the start of the journey. That was the last time we went out together for summers. You know, after that, I would still travel a lot, but we we, we didn't physically go out and not. Mm -hmm. So we had Callie. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, Ava, Ava was, Ava, Ava was on the way and that was when the diagnosis happened. We kind of got off track, but that was when Ava was already here. Yeah. She was, she was six months. Yeah. Six months old. And that rocked us. Uh, we, we had bought a new house. So this is actually a really funny story. So again, going back to just like Chels believing in us more than I believed in myself, like <laughs> the, the downturn had rocked me personally. It did like scared me so bad where, mm-hmm. I was like, we're going to have no debt, mm-hmm. paid off cars with cash, had, mm-hmm. you know, a bunch of money in the checking account. We're paying rent. And it was kind of like happy doing it as long as we could do it. Mm-hmm. And after about the second year, we, Chelsea was like, we need to get a house. Mm-hmm. And it was actually a really good time to buy a house. Um, we kind of bought at the peak before. This is the 
kind of the downturn. There's a lot of really good deals. And so we sit, we're sitting around making goals and we're like, okay, let's get a criteria. Location. Yeah. And and so it was those three things. It was, we want to get a really good deal. Yeah. Yeah. We want to get a really good location, really good Mm -hmm. location to us is we want to be in Orem Provo Mm -hmm. and we want a modern house. Yeah, that's right. And like back then, like all the houses were like stone and stucco and like yeah. naughty alder and like mm-hmm. it just wasn't our vibe we're like mm-hmm. we want we want like a modern kind of want a modern house and so our criteria was pretty tight and i felt pretty good about it i'm like if we can find that house that's a unicorn yeah yeah you know? and we found we found a couple and then there was a day i vividly remember it i can see it in my mind's eye i was sitting at the computer you walked in we had been working with our friend eric for a while we would put a budget of 500 grand by the way which like wow e- e- eric like juiced it a little bit. (laughs) So Eric Woodley, who's like been our realtor and done every real estate deal we've ever done. We, he's the best and you always use him. Um, but he, he sends you the, no, did he send it to me? Yeah. Yeah. No. So you walk in, that's what, that's, that's how it happened. You walk in and you're like, I shouldn't even show you, but I'm going to show you. I'm like, what? So he had sent you the listing. So we look it up and I'm just, I, I'm speechless. It's everything. It's amazing. And I remember telling you like, yeah, you for sure shouldn't have shown me that. Like it ruined <laughs> Cause us. Because now we have to get that house. And it was almost double our budget. It was yeah. like, it was like yeah. eight, $850,000. <laughs> our budget stretching was 500. Yeah. Oh, and, man. and I was like, oh my gosh, like. All right. So then well, we go walk through it. Let's go look at it. We right. Went, we, and it was like even better when we walked through it. We we're just like, we have to have yeah. this house. Yeah. And so. But, remember, it was, but it was pretty interesting because prior to this, we were looking in that neighborhood. Well, it was probably simultaneous to this because the house was priced at what it was. We put money down on a lot. Correct. Well, I think the reason we put money down on the lot was because we couldn't get the house. We we tried to get the house. Okay, that's the time. And the house was like a million four, and the market, like we put an offer at like eight hundred. And so the oh, first, so it wasn't even it was the asking price wasn't even eight hundred. It was no, it was more, a short. Just, it was a short sell. Oh, and the, right, the, right, the, right. The first loan wouldn't accept, or the second wouldn't accept right, the sale. Right, right. And yes. so we kind of we got bummed because we'd found the house. Right. And so then we go down the road and we're like, well, there's a lot in foreclosure. Let's just good location. Yeah. Good price. Right. Let's go, let's go build yeah. a, a modern house. And it was a gem of a neighborhood. Tucked gem of a low. neighborhood. Like we, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so we put that lot under contract. Our money went hard, which was $5,000. Yeah, I still yeah. remember that. Steep. And yeah. And like literally right before, um, we were supposed to buy it. You like had a feeling <laughs> that we shouldn't buy it. Yeah. And it was a like, strong one. And you just like said, I don't think we should buy the lot. And we we're going to buy it with cash. And I'm like, what do you need? Shouldn't buy the lot. Like mm-hmm. we already have $5,000 that went hard. And you're like, I don't think we should buy it. I'm like, okay. And so we <laughs> ended up losing $5,000, which hurt so bad back then. It kind of, but I just knew that you, that you was knew. not our. And I knew I loved you. <laughs> It worked. <laughs> the two together it worked. And so so any, and the next day, Eric called and he said, "Hey, that house you wanted, it's going to foreclosure tomorrow," <laughs> which is so crazy. Yeah, like like when I think back about all the times where you could call it coincidence, you could call it just God, you could whatever it is. It's like there is a bigger plan because all of these things, you know, it it was just like meant to be. And, and it was so, you know, I go back to goal setting every single day. My, I have my little top 10 and one of them was like, buy your dream house. And I had, we had our criteria on our dream house, modern house, good location, good price. And when Eric called, it's like, Hey, it's going, check, check, going check. to foreclosure tomorrow, but you have to pay cash. cash. And what we didn't have was eight hundred thousand dollars cash. Yeah, but what we did have is really good friends. <laughs> so we were really wealthy. We had about four hundred thousand dollars <laughs> cash, and we go to the bank. But we knew, like, 
tomorrow is a chance to buy our house. And so I remember we called Bo Gardner, mm-hmm. said, Bo, will you lend us, you know, 200 grand? And Bo always has like millions of dollars, like under his mattress. So it's just like, <laughs> like, he, like he's, you know, he's rat, he's like a little like squirrel, just rat holding for the winter <laughs> all the time. So he's like, yeah, sure. So Bo lends us some money and then called Sean Brinchley mm-hmm. and said, Sean, will you lend us 200 grand? And he did paid cash for the house and ended up getting a loan and paying him back with interest. And it was mm-hmm. really great. But I, I remember like we lived in that house for 12 years. Yeah. Yeah. And it was so special. I mean, some of our like best life memories and best life friends Still, came from that neighborhood. Yeah. yeah. yeah to this day. And forever friends. Yeah. Well, it, it kind of got off track because we were in that house when we got the diagnosis mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. it was, I still remember how traumatic it was because you, you kind of, we just went like all in. It was like, oh, okay, yeah. what resources exist for autism, yeah. you know, and it was everything from, it was, you know. it was my life for sure. I mean, it was definitely our life, but again, right. It's what I was saying before you had your role, I had mine. And so we just went full fledged into therapy, all sorts of things. Yeah. For years. Yeah, for years. I think a solid four years. Yeah. Yeah. Felt like a lifetime, actually. And it was everything. It was ABA. It was... Play therapy. Horse therapy, therapy. Hippotherapy. Speech therapy. I mean, anything. Yeah. And then it, like, became, like, a really special community because mm-hmm. you go have that experience. Reaching out and, to And then you realize just community. there's other, you know, young married people that are having the same experience. and. Mm-hmm. You know, they're calling you asking, hey, you know, what resources exist and mm-hmm. how can I, you know. Right. But what a blessing them. to have that so early on because we just, we decided. And I remember sitting down with a psychologist at the beginning. Um, and I, I think it was maybe set up through Autism Journeys. It was actually. And he gave us some statistic on um, marriages that, stay together and a percentage of marriages that fall apart because of diagnosis is like this. Yeah. And it was funny because I'm thinking as he's telling me this, there was no, there was no question in my mind that we would be on the camp of, Oh, stay this will together. actually, yeah. yeah, not, not only will we stay together, but this will actually make us stronger. Um, not that it was easy. None of it was easy. Um, but I think one of the biggest blessings of our marriage, because it really, I mean, it just goes back to what you were saying. It's these low points or these rock bottom moments that strengthen you yeah, and make you better than you were before. Yeah. No. And we were super, we were super blessed because we, there was, there was a nonprofit organization that was a one-stop shop kind of ahead of their time. And, you know, you had your in-house speech therapist, your in-house occupational therapist and your ABA therapist, and you would meet quarterly and they would Yeah, Fraser Fraser Bullock was on the board. We had a, that's right. a fun time to meet and be on the, the board with Fraser and the team there was just the best humans, like just giving their life oh, yeah. to serve Experts, people yeah. and yeah, it was great. Yeah. So we had Ava, had Callie and then there was a little break. Like we, you know, we'd kind of given it a break kind of on purpose just cause we we're getting through things. Mm-hmm. And then Callie just kind of like developed yeah, really rapidly. And, um, I don't want to say grew out of the diagnosis, but kind of grew out of the diagnosis. She, she just, like, yeah, whether it was coping mechanisms or whatever, her brain was very receptive to the therapy. And yeah, that was about second grade when yeah. we had a, we wanted to get her re-diagnosed. And we, we went in, we got her re-diagnosed and the diagnosis came back that she wasn't on the spectrum. I mean, she was on the spectrum a little bit still. I mean, she's still, I, even to this day, if you ask her, she, she that's, that's like a really, um, important part of her life that she still clings to actually. Yeah. Yeah. She finds value there. But, um, which we never really knew how to discuss that. Like even how to talk to her about it. Yeah. It's like adoption. There's no, 
there's no exact right or wrong way to. Because his dad, I'm like, I don't want it to be a crutch. I don't want it to be like a, you know, a reason you can't do something. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, it's like, Mm -hmm. I don't want to go create these self-limiting restrictions. Right, because it's only, it's your full identity. Yeah. Yeah. But it never has been for, it's, you know, it's kind of been a part of the journey. And yeah, yeah, she really has. It's kind of been an empowering part of the journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. As she's gotten older, I think it's become more empowering. It's had Ava. Had Callie, and then there was a break for a couple of years, mm-hmm. and then we had Covey, mm-hmm. and I, I still remember with Covey, Stephen Covey was like this author Big that mentor. just like yeah changed my life. You right. know, I put him on that list of like that short list of people that changed your life, and he did. You know, the way I see the world is so influenced by kind of his literature and his teachings and his contribution. And so to, had kind of talked to him and said, "Hey, I really want to name one of our kids Covey." Mm-hmm. You know, Which whether, I liked. Whether, whether it's a boy or whether right. it's a girl. like. Well, I mean, we really we really liked it for a boy, but that just wasn't happening. Yeah, we, we just can't make boys. <laughs> <laughs> so we, so we, had, we had Cubby, and she's just a gift. You know, she loves her mom she's the special. most. She yeah. for sure loves her mom the most. Um, and then it kind of went for a while. You know, we were going to kind of space it out. We, we wanted a bigger family. And we couldn't have kids, right? right? Something, something just happened. It just kind of turned off. Unexplained, yeah. And so we went through that process of doing in vitro, kind Which of. Which was really rough. Yeah, it was kind of extra rough. Mm-hmm. Like it, it was really tough. They're just kind of pumping you full of hormones. Mm-hmm. That's and, the way it works. Yeah. And yeah, I still remember kind of like. What were what yeah so we we get we get through that 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 didn't work out for us and you were on board with adoption from the beginning I mean it was actually more I wouldn't say more your idea but you were definitely more open to it what do you think that stemmed from I don't know I don't know I just have always trusted mm. I've always trusted because it wasn't it wasn't you growing up with ideas that you were going to adopt anyone. No. I, I mean, I've, I've always mind. just kind of trusted that, like, like life is happening for us and not to us. And there's a yeah. bigger plan. And we wanted to have kids, couldn't have kids. And it's like, well, how else are we going to have kids? Right, and it's like, right. we either keep the family that we have, which we were pumped with, or mm-hmm. or we go adopt. And you weren't, you weren't as kind of warm to the idea originally. No, no, but... I I it, I think it helped that you were trusting and felt like it would work out the way that it was supposed to, and so I thought, well, I mean, it doesn't hurt to go down that road and just yeah. explore. But remember, the first agency we picked, it was a total fail. We went, we did the interview. We just weren't feeling it. No, I mean, the second I, it was the second we even drove up to the building, I thought, oh, this is not it. Yeah. And then we walked in. And then it further confirmed that we walked away. I'm like, yep, we're just we're not, doing not it. going with it. Yeah, not. Yeah, not and, doing it. And you weren't you weren't feeling it either. But it's it's crazy. I mean, the adoption stories are truly remarkable. Every single one of them is uniquely special, and ours was no different. And um, yeah, I mean, babies are supposed to come when they're gonna come. Yeah. Because we didn't we didn't stop. I mean, we just. We just knew we were going to adopt, and we did the paperwork. It was finalized. Yep. We were matched. CJ was in our home. Yep. It was no, just it, was, to be. it was kind of this crazy time where my little sister had had adopted a boy, Jack, and it just so happened that he was in Utah. My sister and Patrick lived in Montana. Right. And so they called us, and we were we went up kind of right after the baby was born. And then it was the craziest thing. My sister got super sick Mm -hmm. to the point where she couldn't be around the baby. And so you got to watch Jack for like the first week Mm -hmm. of his life. Mm -hmm. And I think it was the first time for you where you realized like, oh, my gosh, I can love. Oh, yeah. I can love a baby that's not my own Mm -hmm. baby, just like my own. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It was like the first time where it just like hit you where it's like, oh, man, like. Right. I think that was when we decided, like, yeah, let's do it. Well, so what's interesting is that was January of, um, no, 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 no. That was January of 2018. 
So well, that was early. Yeah. So we were not, we were just at the beginning of our fertility journey. Okay. So we weren't thinking it at all, at all. Um, but yeah, that definitely planted the seed that, Yo. that planted the seed for sure. So we decide to adopt, um, go through the process, number of failed, you know, mm -hmm. where, you know, you, they give you a, they call it a situation, the birth mm -hmm. mom. Um, and we'd given, you know, said, yeah, we, we'd like to adopt. And then the birth mom didn't choose us. And so, you know, that happened a couple of times. And I remember we're at Disneyland with our kiddos and we get this call mm -hmm. um, from the agency we worked with. It's an agency called Heart to Heart. And they said, yeah, like we, the birth mom chose you mm -hmm. and you're, you're going to meet her next week and the baby's coming in. Three. Were you hearing the conversation going on? Yeah, on you, you were you were talking my to My watch, him. actually. Yeah, and I, I, I remember you were like almost like speechless. Like it, oh, was, yeah. it was so nonchalant. Yeah, yeah, on their end. Yeah. Yeah. It was bizarre. And you're like, what? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Could, yeah. Couldn't put my finger on anything. Yeah. Like, whoa, it, whoa, whoa. What it, is happening here? It was here? so crazy. You were just kind of freaking yeah. out. So, but we're also like so pumped and we go home and it's Monday, Monday and I'm at, I'm at Vivint and that was the day that Todd and Alex announced that we were going public through a SPAC. The day we got back? The day we, like I was in the meeting when they're announcing it to like the company. Oh my gosh. Clearly my mind was not there because I don't <laughs> even recollect that at all. No, it was like a really important meeting and get a, you know, get a call for me. And, and you're like, the birth mom, Jessica, she had the baby. <laughs> and I'm like, what do you mean she had the baby? We're supposed like it's supposed to be like three weeks out. She no, had five, five to six. Yeah, weeks and she out. had the baby and like the baby's at the hospital. <laughs> so it went from like Saturday at Disneyland, figure out like we're having the baby to it's game on, like Monday right, morning. Right now. And so we we go charging into the hospital. We're buying, you know, baby clothes and mm -hmm. Car you know, seat. Car seat and all that, those things. Yeah. We go in and we meet Jessica and we meet CJ. And it was just like this surreal experience where all of a sudden you, you just go meet your little man who's part mm -hmm. of the family. And then similar situation with Tex and happened pretty fast and now five five kids. Yeah, so... CJ was so crazy because I'd worked at Vivint for a long time. I'd worked at Vivint, I don't know how many years. It was, what, 14 or 15 years. And um, finished up, you know, transitioned out of Vivint 2019. And it was right after we had CJ. And I'd gone from being so busy for so long to all of a sudden, like, my phone's not ringing. And it was really like weird for me. It was kind of hard for me. I was like, what do I do now? Very but, weird. But also we had like this little baby. And so I just spent a ton of time with CJ. And it was just like these really special times mm -hmm. where it's me and him going on walks and hanging out. And, you know, I think there's always like that special connection. I'm always yeah, you didn't have you didn't have any issues with adopting and fallen in love with either of the boys no or, out of any of the kids i was probably the most connected with it was cj yeah just and, because of the situation and the time i just yeah. had so much time to just spend with them and we still had other young kids and so you know you'd be spending time with covey and some of the other kids kind of getting them ready for bed or whatever and i was just mm -hmm. always with cj mm -hmm. and it was so special and same thing with tex i mean it was just like this instant little connection mm -hmm. Um, different story, but instant, you know, connection. Yeah. Yeah. So, so now, yeah. What do you, what does it feel like? Because you had, you had the, you know, trenches of Vivint and, you know, being in work and then you had this lull and now you're back at it with Sandlot. And I had like a couple of gifts, like right at that moment, Corbin church, was one of our neighbors, Corbin and Kara. Mm -hmm. And he taught uh, entrepreneurship up at BYU. And we went to dinner with those guys and the Wilkinsons, Tommy and Abby. And and um, 
they, he asked me, Hey, do you want to teach a class with me? Mm-hmm. And I was like, yeah, that'd be awesome. And I am thinking to myself, well, I'm a dropout from college. What am I going to teach? And it's like, well, I am too, you know, so. I didn't know that. Yeah. And so it's kind of like, all right, you know, let's do it. And, you know, that's ended up becoming something that's been so fun and special. Mm-hmm. It's been four years now. Wow. But that, that like filled like this gap for me at that point, teaching entrepreneurship up at BYU. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, you know, we had invested in a number of these other businesses. And so staying busy and then golf saved me. Like I had never played golf before. I always felt like it was so indulgent, taking up so you much. didn't like it. You didn't, didn't like enjoy it. it. Yeah, I felt like it was just taking up so much time and didn't have time for it. And then all of a sudden it was like, this is my, like, it's this thing this. that takes time and like captures me mentally and you know, it was kind of a, like a little plug. It was that for a lot of people in America, I would say. When COVID, like right. that, that's, that's COVID why. was just nuts. I, I, that still is actually really funny to me. Like how it was like, you had like the women and children in the house <laughs> and the men at the golf course safe. That's how it appeared <laughs> in like, our So weird. Area. I'm like, this is so weird. Like let's, you got like literally people like, like caged into their house. <laughs> and then all the guys are like, out. Like, that's play. right. Because I remember <laughs> talking to some of my girlfriends asking if their kids could come play, because I remember you saying that you had seen some of their boys out playing golf. Yeah. And so I'm like, yes. Okay. I've got someone that I can call and not offend, you know, by asking if they can come and play. Nope. <laughs> the girls wouldn't come and leave their house. <laughs> it was so weird that it was like the COVID times were just. It was a little trigger. Me. I didn't like that. It was so crazy. Get out of here, 1950s. It was crazy. <laughs> it was so crazy. Like it just all logic crazy went out the window. All yeah. yeah. All logic went out the window. It was nuts. So what would you say? What would you say it's like having five kids now? Uh, That's kind of how we started. Yeah, it, it, it's kind of how it always had to be. Like I, mm-hmm. I, I look at every one of our kids and I'm like, it never couldn't have been this way. Like they mm-hmm. always had to be like these were like from the beginning of time. These were this was our family. Like mm-hmm. it had to work this way. You know, that's how I feel. I just five kids is pretty crazy. What would you say? What What are the things that we do that? Um, I mean, I, I, I think that we try the effort is to to prioritize our marriage right Uh, because we talk often about you know if 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 we're not working like the the ship is gonna sink yeah 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 um so with the what do you think the key things are that we do um so there's there's certain things that we've always been so good with our whole marriage we've always gone on weekly dates you know, for us, like we, our faith is important. We've always gone to church together on Mm -hmm. Sundays. We've always kind of gone to the temple together once a month. We've gone, you know, on trips, like made these like trips, me and you really important kind of all throughout our marriage. Mm -hmm. And I think those like kind of staples are just like structural habits that like bring us together and are forcing functions to to talk and to connect and be intimate and all those, you know, things that are just so important in a marriage. And I think with the five kids, you just get pulled on, you know, and starting a business, you get pulled on and there's so Mm -hmm. many things that are taking you away from there. But I think those have been anchors for us to just stay close and stay connected. Yeah. Really, really important because I think even just for, for moms out there and for myself, we, your job never ends. And so, I mean, you can get pulled in every direction from, you know, depending on the spread of your family from 6 a.m. because your two-year-old's waking up till 11 p.m. because your 15-year-old's up. And, um, yeah, we talk a lot about the importance of, of planning each week and understanding yeah, like, where when, am when, I spending when, my time. When I think about my career – there is no possible way that I could have had the success in my career without us being a team. Mm -hmm. It just would not have worked. Mm -hmm. Like it's a team career and like to be able to rate like you, your role has been to like 
raise the family a lot right. of the time. And we were talking about that the yeah. other night because that's a really hard thing for women in today's world. Yeah. That that because there there isn't really any um accolade for the mom at home. When you're kind of going on like this, just like growth tear the last two to three years where I've just seen you like really put in a tremendous amount of work in yourself and your mental health and your just growth, you know, personal growth, spiritual growth, you're studying every day. You've got a life coach. You've, you know, just put in like this real effort and I, you know, but there's this feeling of like, our family is number one. It's our, yeah. it's our most important thing. And our marriage is, you know, obviously important. But then also you have like these dreams and you've got this desire mm-hmm. to go like make a dent in the world that's more than the kids and me and, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, walk, yeah walk, it's walk, really easy to walk, get short-sighted. Yeah, walk, walk me through that. Like what's going on in your life right now? Like what 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 is this thing that's calling to you? Um, I don't, I don't know. I I really, I really don't know. I, I like, I like growth. I like, um, learning. I love learning. Um, but I, I also know that we're at a critical time in our family life where the kids really, really need me. And I see that every day. I mean, literally there's something every day that happens. And I think I am truly grateful that I am in a spot where I can be here yeah, to have that conversation or to how, be how, how, how here do you, and how do you balance how do you balance that though because there's like one little voice in your head that's saying this is the most important thing yeah. that I can do on this earth right and there's another voice that's like and you got to go take over the world like you got to go like yeah. make your dent in the world that's bigger true. than that like how, I actually how you- just watched Barbie with Callie and I'm like eh, I don't know how I feel about that movie actually <laughs> <laughs> I mean I get it but yeah, this 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 idea that women can be anything and everything and the most powerful people on the planet, which yeah, I mean, all of us have that divine potential within us, but um being able to focus and center yourself and recognize what truly matters most, sometimes it doesn't match up with what the world says you should be. And that's when it gets really hard. But we were talking about it the other day. Really one tool in particular that is crucial for me is planning. And we do it really differently. You know, I've, I've dabbled in your way and I like it, but I, I do it, you know, in my way. And, um, sometimes I'm a little scattered and sometimes I'm not as consistent. Um, because, you know, really just having babies and kids at you all the time, it, makes it very inconsistent. But when I can sit down and list out my roles and literally see them on paper and then, you know, I'll, I'll consistently write down mother and wife and scholar and, um, you know, philanthropist and community member and disciple of Christ. And, um, you know, just, just even like my personal life, And then I can go through each of those for the week specifically, right? It's really easy to look at my life for the, for the week. And I can write down all the things that I have. Yeah. Seeing it with my, my eyes is different than even just, you know, thinking it through in my head. It's different. And I can see, oh man. And, And, and being able to look back on previous weeks and saying, wow, I haven't really spent time with Kelly. I need to do something with Callie. I need to take Callie out. And then you go through all your roles and you realize, oh, this is my life and I love my life. And this is, these are the important rocks. Yeah. I I think about this Covey quote of the things that matter least can never be at the mercy of the things that matter most. Mm. And I I just think without planning. Right. You just get pulled. Right. You, You know, a lot of good things end up drowning out the great things. Right. And I think you have to just be so deliberate. That's the word. Yeah. 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 Or else all the things will be, um, you know, taking over. I mean, I say this all the time. I'm so lucky to be married to you. <laughs> like really, like you're, you're the best. And I, 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 I really am 
so lucky to be married to you. I've loved being married to you for 18 years. Um, can't wait for the next stages in the journey. Like I've, I, I love being a newlywed. I've loved having kids. I've loved the, the hard times and I've, you know, the good times we've had million good times. Mm-hmm. We have so many friends and so many just like really special relationships but I think the one constant is kind of you've always been my number one. Mm. And it allows – it's been like this foundation of comfort and safety and support and just strength that's allowed me to kind of go try to be the best version of myself and go, you know, I'm, I'm – my goals and aspirations are so so much bigger and probably more noble Mm-hmm. being married to you and then being the dad of our kids. Mm-hmm. You know, it's much less about me and it's more about providing, you know, and it drives me. And so. Well, thank you. Yeah, I I think our marriage is incredibly special, but I also think it's because we work so hard at it, you know. We talk about it all the time, like we're, the older we get, the more we see friends that are getting divorced. Mm-hmm. Their marriages are falling apart. Mm-hmm. I don't think anybody starts down that road when they get married of, you know, I can't wait till we hate each other and get divorced. You know, it's like my own life and you're living your own life. Yeah, But you just like, I I think about me and you and we're fundamentally different people today than we were 18 years ago. And so you're either, you're either growing together, you're growing apart. And I think sameness is like not the goal. Like me and you are very different people. Yeah, I think it would get. I, I think it would become very dull. Yeah, we we have, we're very different. <laughs> we didn't think we were so different when we first got married. I thought, oh, opposites attract. No, that's not true. Casey and I are very similar, but no, we're, yeah, we're very different. We're very very different, but we have shared values. You know, we yeah. we actually like, you know, and then that that's what synergy is is the, you know, the magic of the differences, and mm-hmm. I'm, you know, grateful that we're different. Mm-hmm. Well, baby, I love you so much. Um, Have loved doing this podcast with you and just talking about our life and talking about stories. It's been really fun. Love you. Love you too. 